QE2 couldn't go into the um, exclusion zone because it was too valuable a target, it was deemed. So we cross-shipped to other ships, and I was part of the brigade recce party that went on to HMS Antrim, which had massive wooden pegs plugged into its hull where it had been attacked mm -hmm. previously. So they were feeling pretty battle-hardened by the time we got there. We had about 24, 36 hours on Antrim, and then moved into Intrepid, a sort of fat-bottomed assault ship. We were all quite pleased when, when we got down there and got off. And, um, and I, think I spent the first night in, in a sort of wood, wool baling shed trying to find out where the flights were, and uh, without much joy. And I remember having to take a boat and go out and find them, which ship they were on. And then we all got together um, in a place called Clam Valley. We went ashore with a group of other people we'd never seen before uh, through this hole in the side of the ship. We come to it and you look down and the sea is 40 foot plus feet below you and this little bright orange lifeboat bobbing along and as, this, as the waves came in it rose up and come up near you and then sunk back down another 40 feet again. And what we were told was, as it's ticking down, you jump and you've got your webbing on and your burgundy and everything. And basically what happened was you, you jumped to this board and because you had so much weight on you, you didn't bounce. And then there were two sailors, one on each side, grabbing your webbing to lift you up and plump you on the side of this, this seat. So as they, uh, obviously they arrived on a series of ships, um, we were running a, like a little mini training session and transferring all the information that we'd learned about operating with the Navy, uh, the Argentinian Air Force, uh, what had happened at Goose Green, what we'd found worked and what didn't work. Um, simple lessons like um, we never refuel the aircraft more than half full because um, if, you put it, if you fill the aircraft fully up, you were limited in terms of what you could carry. And a lot of the jobs we were doing was carrying people or under some loads or food or whatever. Two were armed with SS-11 missiles. I was one of the two that armed with SS-11 missiles. And the other ones were stripped of everything. And we're each going to carry four parachutes paratroopers with machine guns and they would between the SS-11 and the GPMGs they would where they would form the fire support because uh, obviously we were well out of range of our own artillery and there wasn't time to divvy up um, harriers or anything like that and it took us obviously quite a long time to get there uh, we didn't see anything on the way we fired four missiles um, it wasn't totally successful frankly um, some of them went rogue which meant as soon as they got off the, off the rails, the aircraft, the missile went off and wouldn't uh, command what they call command to line of sight. Um, but it didn't really matter because actually the houses were completely deserted. There was no civilians and there was no Argentinians. And I'm listening to the chatter. I've got, I've got uh, several different radios networks on my headphones and I could hear this chatter and I'm thinking something is not right here, Some, something's wrong, uh, it sounds like uh, we've lost an aircraft. So I put it at the RC and said I think something's wrong here so you know somebody turn it. Got, got on to this and we, we listened in and then we actually we, did, we determined that we'd, we'd lost an aircraft. Um, unfortunately when they did find the crew they were all, they were all dead. So, uh, un un unfortunate. Um, that was probably the saddest part of there. And that, w and then we had the most terrible night, where um, the Gazelle flight in on Lithuania were tasked to fly two people up to the rebroadcast station um, to maintain contact with the forward troops. And um, it was a clear night. They set off. We lost contact with them, 
the rebroadcast station reported that they'd seen a, seen a bang and a loud and a big flash in the sky and we assumed it was the helicopter and we assumed it had been taken out by, by the Argentines and we didn't know where they were. So I delayed the search for them till the next morning and then went out in a scout with them. In fact, we had an armed scout and, and others just to make sure we were okay. And we found the helicopter, we found the bodies, very sad time. I went back to Ajax Bay to collect body bags um, and because um, obviously we needed to uh, collect the bodies and um, whilst my crewman was out trying to find some body bags, um, RSM from Two Para got into the back of my aircraft. Now you've got to imagine they just uh, completed goose green, I think they had 16 killed and 40 odd wounded who we casimacked and we sat in the back of my aircraft, the blades were going round. And I have to say, both of us cried. It was one of those surreal moments when you reflected on what had happened and we just lost our own aircraft with everybody dead, uh, all the casualties and the people who died. Uh, and it was one of those surreal moments. The casualties that we, and I took back from Galahad, I mean, the thing that struck me most was just the um, two things, really. One, that whether they're full of morphine or not, but they, they didn't seem to say anything. Oh, they're obviously in great pain, numb by the morphine, perhaps. Um, but just the smell of the, the burnt flesh, which, you know, I had, hadn't come across before. So that's um, flying, flying with, you know, the, the smell of burnt flesh in the cockpit is, I mean, he's, you know, not that you felt sorry for yourself, you, are, you felt devastated for the guys, you know, the passengers that you were carrying, whose lives were going to be changed forever.